As many of you will know, we celebrated our 200th episode of Swarf and Chips last week and we had a competition running because we were racing around Blyton Park in that incredible sports car called the Zero. Our competition was to win a day out at the great British sports cars and a ride in one of those cars. Now, congratulations to the winner. Well done to you because you get myself as being the fastest racer and the time as well. So well done to you, congratulations. Now on to the next episode 201 and Colin is at Kale & Co. So welcome to this week's Fourth and Chips. This week's Warford Chips, we're at Cale & Co up in Sunderland. It's a great story about diversification and more recently automation to take you into different markets. So how long has the company been going and what sort of markets were you originally sort of looking at? Yeah, the company's been going nearly nearly 50 years now, Colin. Um, I haven't been part of it for that long, but uh, I joined it in 1977 when I left school and I briefly left it for about 12 years to work for another company and came back in around about 2000 and eventually ended up owning the company in around about 2002. Um, so prior to, well, up to 2002 though, what sort of markets were you serving? Um, it was basically, um, if you imagine that we're working in local markets, we had a lot of mining and shipbuilding in the early days, and then as time went on, those industries came and went, and uh, so we're basically then we're supplying people like Coles cranes with um, parts for making cranes, but in 2002, we began to recognise that all the local industries like that were, were starting to grow, and I took the decision to move the company into oil and gas. Okay, so oil and gas from 2002 up to, well, the last few years recently, and you've seen peaks and troughs with that. What sort of percentage of, of your income or your, or your sales were oil and gas at the peak? Uh, at the peak, probably around about 70%, yeah, and then, once that down, that bad downturn came, um, I think I recognised that it was quite an exposure there for us. Now, at the moment, it's still a big part of our business, but it's only around 40%. Okay, so a lot of diversification. What other markets are you working in? A um, little bit of aerospace, um, a reasonable amount of defence nowadays, um, where we're doing stuff you know, for one or two local companies as well. Um, motor sport, most most markets, you know, we don't we don't do an awful lot in the medical market, but we do supply a lot of valve equipment for the medical market. Okay. Now, you've got two machine shops on two different sites. I'm gonna put you on the spot. How many machines have you got? Oh, I've lost count, Colin. Honestly, must be 40, 50 machines. Now. Right. And that ranges from Nakamura's. Yeah, the small Nakamura's. Um, they're the smallest turning centres right up to the large Toshiba, which will take about 1.2 metres on vertical turning. So some big turn parts, yeah. big mill parts. Now in terms of, so you've diversified in terms of, of the industries you're serving, those machines you've got, those so Nakamura's, your mills you're doing a lot of turning on those as well? Yeah, we've got a lot of uh, machines from Mill CNC, very reliable. They're the workhorses in the company, they're what keep us going. They're the plane machines, the two axis turning centres. Um, and they, uh, when we're looking at Twin Spindle, we've got Akuma and uh, Nakamura. Okay, now what I want to then, then do is co cover off in terms of automation because prior to, prior to ba basically light, light bulb moment, I'm going to say, is you know, you had single, single tables, your five axis machines, a lot of Matsuras for example, a lot of Mills machines, you had some twin pallet machines. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've always touched on it, we've had bar fed lathes, we've also had uh, twin pallet horizontal machining centres. Uh, we, we moved into five axis machining probably about six, seven years ago now. Um, but we've always had single table machines generally, you know. Um, but recently, uh, I've had my eyes opened. Yeah, so it's uh, all changed. When, yeah. when did that occur? Yeah, I, I went to Japan, Matsura took me to Japan um, in 2019. And also went to visit a lot of other companies out there and um, basically seen how automation worked and thought it was like a light bulb moment as you say and I thought when I get home I'm, I'm going to try and change the way we work. 
were too, were too dependent on, on highly skilled people doing low quantities and not enough time to do batch production. Okay, and with those highly skilled people, some of the jobs they're doing are like, relatively basic, so you need to move them onto the more skilled jobs, I should imagine. This is it. People, people are automatically assumed when they think automation, they think you've got that volume, and that's not the case. Either. That's interesting to hear as well, because yeah, people think you know, you've know got to have 5,000 off, 10,000 off to make it worthwhile. Not the case. No, definitely not. When it, when it comes to automation on machining centres like Matsura, what you have to think of is sitting in the background is a huge capability for to handle tooling, um, tool breakage, making sure that the machine keeps going and also a lot of safety factors which frighten operators about leaving them running overnight. But if you've got all that built in, you have the security of being able to sleep on a night because you know that if one tool breaks, they're not all going to break. It's going to sit there wait till you get in. So that, that's reassurance for them. Okay, so with that in mind, the first sort of multi-pallet, not twin pallet, but multi-pallet machine is the MX330 from Matsura? Yeah. That was, that was where we dipped our toe. I seen that out in Japan and I thought it's a good start because, yeah, it's a good start because it's, it's one stage further than a five axis machine with the capability of being able to do work on 10 different tables. So I thought that would be good to get us going and, it, and a year later we're already beginning to realise that we, we, you know, we're moving into that area and we can get a lot more out of automation which is why we've recently purchased the MAM 72. Okay, now in terms of the, the, the MX330, how many, how many pallets has that got? That's got 10 pallets, but that, that, that doesn't stop at being able to do 10 jobs, it, you know, over, over one cycle. You could do 10 one-offs, right? But also, you need to, what we've done is we've, um, we've looked at how we work hold everything on those tables, so it's dead easy to change, you know? How long is it going to take you to change in? I think, I think we can change over in 20 minutes, half an hour. Whereas in the past, doing low quantities, we could spend four, five, six hours setting the machine up. So massive time saving. Massive time saving. saving. In terms of, I mean, if you're running 10, 10 different jobs, 10, pa 10 pallets, is there an issue with tooling? I mean, how many tools does this machine hold? You, we haven't filled that yet. And we, we, you know, we've had the machine a year now. We've probably manufactured I'm talking repeat business here, Colin. We've probably manufactured, I would say, at least 40, 50 different components on that machine. So every time a new order turns up, the tooling's already there, the programs are already there, and it's just a simple matter. If it's a vice, the vice goes onto the, onto the plate that, we, that we're using, and, and one clamp and screw, and then we're away. Brilliant. Now, talked about the Matsura, the MX330, but you've also gone in terms of your turning, you've gone automation on that, not just your bar feeds, which, which we've already mentioned, but an Akuma, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we've got an LB3000 with a cell row um, automation cell on it, which is a FANUC robot, which does all the loading. And we've, we've now had that since February, and um, we've done one batch of components on there, but it's literally ran now for two to three months solid. Okay, so just leave the robot arm running and that's it, nice and simple. That's it. it you know, it, everybody says, oh, at the beginning, you don't go into lights out machining overnight. Basically, you take your time, you get comfortable with it. You might run it for an hour or two each night, which is what we did. And then all of a sudden you start to realise, well, yeah, it's run all day, so why can't I run it all night as well? Absolutely great. Now, is this in terms of sort of stock holding production for, for clients, has it changed? Are you, are you producing more to hold, hold for them in ready for, for their orders? We are, Colin, but we'd rather be doing that than setting machines, you know. Let's say we get a repeat component that comes in several times a year, you know. It's seven times the five, six hours set up. We've lost all that. We've also thought about once it's set, we're not, we haven't got any labour on there. We've basically just got somebody loading billets, which doesn't taste very long. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms, I mean, there is an impact in your cash flow in terms of holding that stock, but that's offset by all the, the other cost savings and all Yeah, the cost savings obviously in the wages, yeah, and you know, I don't look at it that we're going to, we're going to, you know, say to people, oh, we're going to have to make it redundant. What, what, where we have a problem is doing low quantities, and that is the bulk of our business. So sitting in the background, we've got all the automation running, 
and the guys are getting on with the low quantities without worrying about machines standing and doing nothing. It's a great story in terms of diversification, especially you know the oil and gas coming down and things like that. So it's really fantastic, and also going in, you know taking that that step into automation, which I think some engineers are a bit sceptical about. But without opening the floodgates for sort of machine tool salesmen, where to next? Do you think? More automation, Colin. I, I, I think we're all beginning to realise we're not going to we're not going to invest now in low low tech machinery. We're always going to look for the ones which will run unmanned to basically make people's lives a lot more easier. Brilliant. That's what we want. Making lives people's lives a lot easier. Steve, Kale and Co. Thank you very much. Thank you.